35 hours and five minutes out of Guam in the Southwest Pacific, a B-29 Super Fortress lands in Washington to set a long distance flight record. Colonel Clarence Irvin and his crew of 10 are congratulated by General Arnold, Air Force's commander. Flying 8,198 miles without stop for a new world mark, the men receive the distinguished flying cross. Another milestone is passed in aviation history. This building in the suburbs of New York City houses a unique institution, the Bulova School, designed especially for wounded American veterans. Doors opened by electric eye controls are one convenience provided as disabled veterans learn the highly skilled trade of watchmaking. Under an experienced faculty, the veterans embark on a new career. Among them are a former truck driver, a music teacher, a chef, and a riveter. After training, they are assured of employment. 1,400 United States jewelers have offered jobs for the school graduates. The school is run without cost to the veterans. Peacetime careers as craftsmen are ahead for these men who serve their country. <music> Japanese men and women who renounced their United States citizenship during the war, along with diplomats arrested in Europe, are deported from Seattle, Washington to their homeland. are the former Japanese ambassador to Berlin and Japanese aliens who have lived in America for 30 and 40 years. Many have expressed the hope that they can help in the reconstruction of their shattered homeland. Central Park in New York moves the first holiday parade since the war. Two million turn out for the two and a half hours of fun and merrymaking. miles from Times Square in Hollywood, the lights come up on Santa Claus Lane as the West Coast, too, gets into the swing of the Christmas holiday season. looks forward for the first time in years to a peacetime Christmas. Behind barbed wire in Germany is the cream of the German general staff. 287 generals are in allied custody. Now the conquerors of Poland, Holland, and France perform the same menial task as any other war prisoner. Under the Nazis, this was a forced labor camp, now converted to house these top officers. Major General Eric Fiedler whittles. His superiors, Generals Yodel and Keitel, are already on trial at Nuremberg. General Siegler plays war games, while two field marshals, von Liszt and von Leib, indulge in a different game with homemade cards. A 
salute for a United States enlisted man from General von Griefenburg, who once attended the United States General Staff School. Germany's arrogant military caste learns the meaning of defeat. Testifying before a congressional committee is General Dwight D. Eisenhower, former Supreme Allied Commander, now named United States Army Chief of Staff. General Eisenhower advocates a year's compulsory training for the nation's youth, pointing out that there would not be adequate time for that training during any possible future war. This can only be accomplished by training our civilian reserve, our citizen army. The most democratic way to do this is by universal military training in which every able-bodied young man is fitted to discharge his particular duty to protect our freedom. Asked if he believes there is any chance of a lasting peace, the general emphatically answers, Mr. Congressman, if I didn't think there was a chance of that, I wouldn't be here. I would jump out of my plane in the middle Atlantic. If the world has got to face the certainty of war, then I think it's high time the civilization was calling it a day. Now, the actual fact is that I believe this to be the greatest move that the United States can make in the direction of preserving the peace. I will tell you a conviction of which I'm perfectly certain. There's not a single country in Europe that fears strength in the United States. The only thing they fear is that we will go back to what we thought was isolation and do it by dismantling our strength and going back to where we were before. <laughs> ravaged Manila, the first Pacific War Crimes trial continues. Spectators are searched as General Yamashita arrives. The former Japanese commander in the Philippines is charged with responsibility for the wholesale rape and murder committed by his forces in Manila. This is the first time a military man has been brought to the bar of justice to answer for atrocities committed by his men. Presiding Judge Major General R.B. Reynolds opens the session. And we'll proceed with the trial of the United States versus General Tomoyuki Yamashita. The Army prosecutor brings witness after witness to document the orgy of mutilation and torture during the enemy's retreat from the city. A 10-year-old Filipino girl tells of her experience with the enemy. And what did they do there? They bayoneted me. Well, show the commission where they bayoneted you. They bayoneted me. Anywhere else? Yes. Where? The back. How many times in the back? Three times. Next, a Manila businessman, Francisco Lopez, gives his horrifying testimony, parts of which cannot even be repeated here. And then we saw them pour gasoline all over that barricade, and we smell the, the smell of gasoline right over us too in the building. And in a matter of a few minutes, they started putting fire to all that, and the fire started all around us. While these other fellows were out with their, these Japanese were out facing us with their guns pointed at us. Naturally, with 1,500 people there approximately, there was a big commotion. Women and the kids lost their heads. They started screaming, yelling, Tomadachi, Tomadachi. What does that mean? Friends, we are friends. We tried to explain we were friends. We were not enemies. We were non-combatants. We were civilians. And then when we saw what was coming to us, somebody, I can't remember now who, decided my, that maybe we could move them by having the women. So many of them had small kids who were still suckling them go out and show them. Naturally, the women volunteered with their little kids, those who had small kids in their arms, to go out. But when they went out over the fire and they knelt before those Japanese soldiers and the officer, what they did is with the bayonet to grab, to, to stick the kids and throw them out. And right there and then, they grabbed most of them by the hair, tore off their clothes and started to abuse them. Now that's the women? The women, yes. The expressionless Yamashita seems unmoved. Whatever the verdict, Yamashita faces justice under international law. Mm -hmm. 